But I know once I got my record deal, once I finally did it, I was shelved for four years. Have you ever dreamt of being a performing artist? One that is signed to a major label, getting access to industry perks like having all the material you need at your fingertips, a fully equipped studio, producers that can help you craft your unique sound, and get your music promoted like major artists Taylor Swift or Billie Eilish, and also fame and notoriety as a result of being signed. After finally being bumped up the ladder of a sea of other artists trying to make it big in music. I'm sure a lot of us have had that dream and wouldn't hesitate to jump on that opportunity. But what if I tell you it's not all glitz and glamour? What if I tell you you might get your project shelved after working on it for a year, not owning the rights to songs you wrote, signing a horrible deal while being told it's the standard, or have the people who once told you or made you feel like you're the shit to all disappear if your album flops, or just simply play games with you. Michael Jackson and Prince were just a few artists who warned us about the exploitative games that the industry plays, and the music industry sadly has more games to play with artists on and off their rosters. Ingrid is an American singer, rapper, and writer that hails from Houston. Ingrid started her career at age 11 in a trio managed by Matthew Knowles, Beyonce's father. Ingrid was close to the Knowles family as they lived on the same street growing up in Houston. She was friends with Solange, and Beyonce would babysit them sometimes. After being known as a rapper while in Houston, Ingrid wanted more. So, she moved to New York City to further her career. Beyonce and Ingrid would reconnect a few years later, which resulted in Ingrid contributing vocals on Beyonce's self-titled album on the track Blow. Then in the mid-2010s, Ingrid signed a deal with Beyonce's record label, Parkwood Entertainment. Since signing to Parkwood, Ingrid hasn't really made significant headway in the music industry or in the mainstream, and is mainly known for writing Love Drought, the seventh track on Beyonce's album Lemonade. While many believe Love Drought explores the relationship between Beyonce and Jay-Z, Ingrid would expose the real meaning of the track in a sit-down with Genius. I'm about to give you the answer I haven't given anybody else, I swear to God, no dramatics or nothing. Beyonce doesn't even know this. Um, but I wrote Love Drought in all seriousness, I was very frustrated with the label at the time, two years ago. Two of the people who were running Parkwood at the time had lied to me and told me that Beyonce wasn't currently listening to any new music, Ingrid says. Shortly after that, in a studio session, Ingrid overheard the same label execs reading off Beyonce's notes on other Parkwood artists' music, a clear indication that she was listening to new music. The frustration fueled her to write Love Drought in a moment of anger. The only way I could really get over it was like, she's gonna sing the song I wrote about her label one day, says Ingrid to Genius. So basically, Ingrid asked the person if Beyonce is listening to any new music because you know Ingrid writes and she's trying to make that shmoney. But she was told, oh, no, 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 Beyonce is not listening to any music. Four days later, at Beyonce's writing camp, the same person was up in her face talking about, yeah, Beyonce is listening to new music. Here are the moods for her new project. Oh, 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 yeah, I know I was being a lying ass bitch a few days ago, but Let's act like that didn't happen, okay? Well, they didn't say that, but a lot of mind games are played in the industry, and I know they wanted to keep things under wraps, but in turn, a lot of artists feel let down or not prioritized by their label. They could have simply said, oh, I'll get back to you on that, but instead, they played mind games on these artists who are probably eating ramen noodles for the past eight weeks. Or is this close to say, fuck it, I'm just gonna get another job and I'm gonna quit music. 
this. And all the love I'm giving is unnoticed. It's just floating in the air. I'm blowing smoke. Looky there. <laughs> Are you aware? And then I switched to like, you my lifeline. Are you trying to kill me? Because like, I mean, shit, I don't have no income. You know, it's like, y'all not trying to reach me to get this going. <laughs> if I wasn't me, as in if I didn't know Beyonce from Houston from growing up, would you still feel me? So yeah, Beyonce took Love Drought and made it fit her story for her album. But it's really about the mind games played on Ingrid by her label. Black Eyed Peas, one of the greatest musical groups of all time, a lot of us know their iconic hits. I Got a Feeling, Where Is the Love, My Humps, just to name a few. The Black Eyed Peas started in the 90s and they became poppin' like extremely popping in the 2000s. The group consisted of Will I Am, Apple the Ab, Taboo, and Fergie Ferg, the only female in the group, but that's not entirely true. Meet Kim Hill. Born Kimberly Alice Hill was the first female in the Black Eyed Peas. Yo, let me get everybody's name. Will I Am. What's up, y'all? This is Taboo Nawasha. This Apple the Ab. Kim Hill featured vocalist. Kim Hill was raised in Syracuse, New York by her mother. Growing up in the suburbs, Kim has acknowledged her privilege as she didn't have to struggle and did a lot of code switching as she grew up in a white neighborhood. Kim moved to Los Angeles to pursue her dreams of becoming a singer. While pursuing her dream, Kim booked roles on TV shows, most notably Living Single. In a showcase for BMI, the artist met Will I Am, who basically introduced her to the rest of the group, and she became a member in 1995. You can hear Kim on songs like Joints and Jam. What it is which are featured on the group's debut studio album, Behind the Front, released in 1998. At the time, Kim had a solo deal with Interscope Records, so I'm assuming that's why you'd see her being listed as a featured artist on those songs she made while in the group. Although Kim was living her dream as an artist, she also had a strong sense of her own morals and values, and she was determined to keep it that way. After the group released their second studio album, Bridging the Gap, released in 2000, Kim would exit the Black Eyed Peas and continued her career as a solo artist. In an interview with the New York Times, Kim explained that the label wanted the group to change, be more commercialized, aka things were getting more corporate, as the merger of Interscope's parent company Universal Music Group and Polygram took full effect, and they wanted Kim to be a different artist, one of a more sexual nature, because sex sells. But Kim wasn't down with that. The group started out being really pure and true to their initial message. And how would you describe the whole Black Eyed Peas musical concept? Musical concept, as you can see, we were really uh, very animated. Right. And I feel we put our personalities first before any gimmick and uh, before any you know materialism. But sometimes when you're a struggling group or artist, you might be willing to compromise in order to make it. When Kim voiced her frustration, they basically were like, um, we want to make it because in contrast to Kim being privileged, the men in the group weren't. The band was very specific about how we were looked at and received by people and being purists, which is why once, the, once it started the pressure started coming to like soften it up and make it super commercial. It was like, we're not really going to do that, are we? And the guys were like, you don't have to go back to East LA if this doesn't work out. There was new management now, so there was a whole different set of expectations and pressure. You want me to grind on Will I Am in a bathing suit? That was being asked of me, never by the guys. That was happening as a, from an executive level. How far out on this plank do you want me to go? The tug of war was about my sexuality and how much of that I was willing to like literally strip down. I never wanted to be objectified while doing my music. I didn't want that burden on my shoulders. So I wrote a letter to management and said, nope. I quit and I had my website and I trademarked my stuff and I was on the road too. 
Although Kim left the Black Eyed Peas and they blew up after her exit, she has no regrets. Part of me can't help but feel like the label was just using her as a placeholder until they could find a female that was more of what they wanted. Yes, I could be wrong, but again, this is the music industry and there's a lot of using people and exploitation going on in the industry. And a lot of times, it's all about who can take you from point A to point B. SZA is the biggest name in R&B right now, no doubt about it. That being said, she's had a rough time with her label releasing her latest album, SOS. SZA's debut album, Control, came out in 2017. So when she announced it on Twitter that her sophomore album would be released in 2020, lots of people were excited, especially how her debut Control impacted the culture. Are we getting anything this year, ma'am? I'm starving. A fan tweeted to which SZA replied, I'd say the date me and Punch just disgust, but that would stress me and build unnecessary pressure. Short answer is yes. But as we all know, the album didn't come out in 2020. On May 2022 at the Met Gala, SZA shared that her album was finally ready to go, more than I've ever felt before. This summer, it'll be a SZA summer. And as we all know again, nothing came out in summer 2022. After that, a fan tweeted SZA in response to news that she would be featured on Persuasive Remix, a song by Doji. The tweet read, Congrats on the collab, but summer is almost over and there's still no album. At SZA, please don't tell me you lied again. So that fan was definitely being shady as they address if SZA lied again. As we all know, SZA used to be lying for no reason back in the day, but that's neither here nor there. After that, SZA would start to blast her label RCA and TDE along with the president for TDE, Punch, causing her and Punch to start going back and forth on the internet. So in short, SZA was accusing her label of delaying her album. SZA said that her album was ready, but she said her label just keep delaying her album. I also want to talk about the situation SZA had with Rihanna taking her song Consideration, a song SZA wrote for her Control album, but it was taken and placed as an opener on Rhee's album Anti. And A, hey, let me tell y'all, that song really is the perfect opener for Anti. Anyway, in 2017, SZA told ID Magazine, I think I needed that song on my album, but then I do also think it was supposed to work out the way it worked out. I wonder though, Control probably would have been completed a year earlier had I kept consideration. In some circles, I think people thought it would do more for me. I didn't think it would do anything, so I guess I landed somewhere in the middle. And recently in an interview with Variety, SZA gave more insight on how frustrated she was with having to give the song to Rihanna, a track she had already shot a video for. I cared so much, I was like, just frustrated, and I felt like I'll never have anything this cool again. It was like the centerpiece of my album at the time, and for her, it was just like a part of her album, and I was like, please no, I had just shot a video for it and like I was about to drop it like in a couple of days. I was so crazy and so wrong, she reflected. I'm so glad that that happened and that it didn't cost me anything. If anything, I just like gained a bunch from it and I thank God that I made cool music outside of that. I don't know why I just really thought my creativity would just like stop and like this was the pinnacle of what I could make. If she has it, then I'll just never be anything. Now initially SZA was invited to Rihanna's writing camp for Anti, but she didn't write anything that they wanted, so what had happened next was SZA wanted to impress Pharrell so bad she performed consideration for him. So it's possible Pharrell relayed the information that, yo, she has this song called Consideration. And yes, it did work out in the end for SZA, just look at her now, but it's pretty fucked up to have plans for your song, shoot a video, and the other team with the bigger artists was just able to take it, although you already had planned for it to be on your album. 
Rihanna heard it, wanted it, her team wanted it, and was able to take it. Just like that. The next artist on the list is Sky Ferreira. If you've ever heard anything about Sky, one of the things that'll come up is how uncompromising she is when it comes to her music. I know some of you might be like, oh my god, who is Sky? The singer was discovered on MySpace and signed a record deal at the age of 15. Sky Ferreira appeared on most people's radar in the early 2010s. Pale white skin, her ice blonde hair, and model eyes made her stand out in the modeling industry. The singer had a somewhat breakthrough after releasing the synth electropop track Everything Is Embarrassing. The song first premiered online on August 30th, 2012, and was later released as a single on April 16, 2013 by Capitol Records in the UK and Ireland. Sky's debut studio album was originally slated for release in 2011, but after the poor performance of the singles that preceded the project, her label refused to release the album. They released two EPs to feed her fans instead and kept pushing back its release date. Ferreira also didn't like the sound the label compelled her to accept. Ferreira told New York Magazine in 2013, it was like, well, she's a dud. I've been told I was a failure since I was 17. I signed a million dollar record deal, she says, and never saw any money. It all got spent on planes and riding. I'd have to leave school and go on a 12-hour flight to Europe and do press, then fly back the same day. They worked me to death, but when I wanted to input anything, it was like, you're a child, you don't know what you're talking about. During the production of her debut studio album, most of the money was gone before it was released or finished. And the singer and her label couldn't come to an agreement, but things took a turn after everything is embarrassing was released. But as I said, most of the money was gone. So in order to finish the project, Sky had to use her own money that she earned from modeling to finalize the project. Nighttime, My Time, her debut studio album was eventually released on October 29, 2013, an indie rock and synth pop heavy album. The album was a moderate commercial success, debuting at number 45 on the Billboard 200, solely from digital sales from iTunes, and the album received positive reviews from critics, receiving a 79 score out of 100 from Metacritic. In 2014, Sky Ferreira confirmed she was working on her second studio album and it would be released in 2015, but that didn't happen. Instead, she released two singles, Downhill Lullaby, released in 2019, and Don't Forget, released in 2020. Last year, she told The Guardian while being described as looking exhausted by her interviewer, her star power depleted. In the sit down, Ferreira said, I'm more just frustrated about the gaps between my, my records. And I got robbed of my 20s. Ferreira, who was 29 at the time, went on to say, My label didn't give me any tour support, she claims. Originally, I was told it was going to happen at least from people I work with. Then I found out that wasn't the case less than a month before. It's like being set up to fail. One of the worst things an artist can do is sign away their masters, but in order to get signed as an unknown artist, 9 times out of 10, you have to sign away your rights. And that's the case of Taylor Swift, the biggest artist in the world right now, who owns the rights of the master recordings, can license it to anyone they sees fit. So let's say Kanye wanted to use Taylor's music. He had to go to the owner for the masters to see if he could license it, and remember, Taylor doesn't own her masters. So imagine how horrible that would be, because Kanye and Taylor has a nasty past. Or let's say a porno wanted to use Taylor's music. The owner of her masters could say, oh, here you go, now let's see some titties bounce to you belong with me. 
When Taylor Swift was 13 years old, she signed a record deal with Big Machine Records. The deal gave Big Machine the ownership of the masters to Taylor Swift's first six albums in exchange for a cash advance. Taylor did have rights to her publishing and was consistent as a songwriter on all of her songs, while at the label. Now, in 2018, Taylor Swift and her lawyer tried to come to an agreement with Big Machine Records in purchasing her masters as her contract was near expiring. Big Machine did agree that they would allow her to buy her masters back, but only if she renewed her contract with them for 10 more years, to which Taylor declined. So they basically told her, we'll give you back your masters, but only, only if you stay with us for another decade, as that's what labels normally do. And Taylor is still an extremely lucrative artist after debuting in 2006, but Taylor had plans of leaving the label, so the parties couldn't come to an agreement. Now here's where things start to get a little bit more spicier. Scooter Braun, former manager of Ariana Grande, fully acquired Big Machine Records for a reported $330 million, meaning whatever masters Big Machine owned now belonged to his company. For those of you who are like, okay, what's the problem? Well, Taylor does not like this man at all. They had disputes in the media, and Taylor even accused Scooter Braun of blocking her from performing one of her old songs on an award show in 2019. Now, Taylor Swift was able to re-record her old music per the agreement she had with Big Machine as a publisher of her old music, and so far, her re-recording her music, it has been really successful. And I'm sure most, including the industry, did not expect the overwhelming amount she would get in doing so. Remember, Taylor Swift is still a relevant artist. So with her re-recording her old music, she's basically preventing Braun and the new owners of her old music from making most of the money that they expected. As a result of all of this, on November 12, 2021, the Wall Street Journal reported that Universal Music Group, the parent company of Swift's current label, Republic, has doubled the amount of time that restricts artists from re-recording their works in their recording deals hereafter. And I'm pulling this straight from the Wikipedia page about this whole debacle. It went on to say, the newspaper said the change represents shifting power dynamics in the music business, as artists have started to demand better revenue shares and ownership of their masters to their music, incentivized by Swift's situation. So the industry is basically saying, because of Taylor Swift and how much money she is making, we did not expect this, so we need to now make it even harder. We need to extend the period for which artists can re-record their music. The situation with Swift also happened to singer Jojo, who lost the rights to her music. Now, if you don't know Jojo, Jojo, she's one of the iconic singers of the 2000s, and she had a couple of hits as well. She made that Get Out song and some other songs as well. One of the reasons why this generation doesn't really know much about Jojo or why we don't really hear too much about Jojo or why her career didn't go on is because Jojo signed a horrible deal under Black Ground Records that's trying to make a comeback right now. Black Ground Records is owned by Aaliyah's dirty uncle Barry Hankerson. After his label went, you know, bankrupt or it failed, it affected a lot of artists in the 2000s, including Jojo. Now because of this, Jojo was involved in a years-long, years, legal dispute with the label since 2009, and it ended in 2014. During this time, Jojo received support from Taylor Swift, with Taylor referring to the situation as fucked up years before the battle with her own label over music ownership. Jojo re-recorded her Black Ground record catalog in 2018 to make it available on streaming services, while the original albums were re-released in 2021. 
Now, let me just break it down a bit. After Black Ground was losing a lot of money, because the label was failing and the streaming era was slowly gaining momentum, but Barry Hankerson did not want to participate in the streaming era until 2021. So he messed up a lot of other artists' bags like Tony Braxton, Tank. That's why you couldn't stream those artists' catalogs on streaming services until 2021, including Aaliyah's. Now, back to JoJo. Unlike Taylor Swift, who can still make a lot of money from her re-recordings, all the money that needed to be made from JoJo's iconic music honestly was already made. And to be truthful, the new music or the do-overs that JoJo did, they just don't sound the same. They don't have that, you know, iconic thing that made it special. They do sound good, don't get me wrong, but they just don't sound the same. It's really fucked up how these record labels, they really play with these artists and they don't really care about them. The music industry like to play games with their artists and unfortunately, there are many more games left to be played.